Good day. My name is Kate Stewart, and I'm a director here at the Linux Foundation. And I've been looking at a lot of issues around embedded and um, safety critical applications and working to see how we can get it so that we can be safely using open source projects in these uh, very important and relevant realms that we're seeing a lot of innovation occurring. One of the um, inspirations for me has been Margaret Hamilton. And she was the um, person that basically programmed the Apollo uh, space mission and working with the team there and did the testing to make sure that the astronauts could get to the moon and back safely over 50 years ago. And a lot of the things that she was talking about then, um, this slide is from the ICSI um, conference in 2019, 2018, sorry. And, um, you know, in there, she's pretty much saying, you know, the challenges you, you had to build man-made software, meaning the astronauts lives were at stake. And that's pretty much the definition of safety critical. When people's lives are at stake, we need to make sure that our software works. And it has to work the first time. It has to be reliable and tested and dependable. Um, so you need also to potentially be able to detect errors and recover in real time. You know, fast forward to today and um, we've just finished seeing, you know, SpaceX's rockets and with the Dragon um, capsule um, go up to the space station and dock and, um, you know, those are all being run with Linux. And so uh, making sure that we have, you know, these applications there um, and that the right level of safety analysis is important is it's going to be key because we're still going back to space. Um, other things are even like, you know, down on the daily streets, we're going to be seeing more and more of these self-driving cars emerging. And then we're going to be having to see the smart cities that have the infrastructure to support them. Um, there is IOT that's emerging as a very pervasive field that will be in cars and around us. And at the part of it all is going to be the fact that we've got safety. And then even to a more recent example, obviously, um, we're in the midst of one of the, you know, worst pandemics of my lifetime. And um, when I first started searching earlier in the summer, um, there was a lot of initial momentum around making sure that there were open source solutions for ventilators that were available that could be, you know, had functional testing, reliability, um, were able to be manufactured um, and are able to be used in the field and so forth. And an open source um, initiative came up to look at which open source options are there for programming them and building them. And, you know, we've seen uh, these systems and people are wanting to create, people are wanting to help and open source gives them a way to do it. So given that, open source is already being used in safety critical applications. So I guess the challenge is now, how do we make it safe? Um, and just to put a little bit more stats around this, you know, 99% of the code base is audited last year and um, had open source components in them. And of those audited code bases, over 70% were made up of open source projects. So um, this isn't all the case in safety critical space, but nonetheless, um, it's here as a pervasive influence over technology and it is moving into the safety space. Um, this was from Black Duck's report earlier this year. And then Sonotype had a report last year that says they're seeing double and triple digit growth in open source components. And these are the components that make these really cool applications that they're already put together. And there's no slowdown in sight. So open source is here and it is the seed for innovation. So the challenge is now, if we're going to be using open source in these safety critical applications, how can we make it safe? And when we talk about safety and safety critical, um, there's a lot of standards out there. And depending on certain domains, um, there is the desire of certain things that they test, but they have a lot of underlying common elements. Um, 61508 is pretty much a general standard and a lot of the initiatives are focusing on it initially because it's a key for automotive railways, nuclear machine safety and industrial processes. So if we can get the generic standards in place then it's a smaller gap to go to the other domain specific ones. However, all of these have in common, as you know, Margaret was saying, is, you know, we need to minimize and mitigate the systemic faults and we need to make sure that it is safe and it needs to be known, tested and managed and it needs to work and recover from problems. And so these properties are still going to be needed here. Um, the thing is that the open source um, has had a different methodology for development than these standards were written in front of. 
And so the question is, how can we reconcile? The other challenge out here is the fact that um, most companies are not able to today to accurately summarize the software that's running on their systems. The modern digital infrastructure, um, you know, is a very sophisticated um, layering of software. And, you know, we build on the shoulders of giants. Well, in the same way, um, some of the modern applications are building on layers and layers and layers of other information. And, you know, um, as this XKCD cartoon neatly illustrates is, the only, there is some project out there that all this stuff is depending on that um, that's not as sustainable as we'd like. And so how do we get these things sustainable? And how do we get this infrastructure to be clear and understood? And part of that's gonna be coming up with some software transparency. So these are the gaps that we're looking at with what we want to be going after and what we need to be going after for that matter and what we have um, available to us today. And so we've got to figure out how we can close these gaps between what the safety standards are looking for and what we have today in this rapid, evolving, exciting open source ecosystem. So the first step is actually being able to understand what you're actually running on your system and improving the software transparency by using some sort of standardized bill of materials. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been an excellent effort from uh, NTIA. Um, they've basically been acting as a sort of a neutral broker to try to bring a bunch of stakeholders together and come up with a common definition of what a software bill of materials should be and what a minimum viable. Like what fields are you to really need to keep in a software bill of materials? And we need to make sure that these, um, this information is there and the connections between the components to components and relationships are articulated. And this covers, you know, open source and proprietary, free and paid. It's just a question of we need to figure out how we can map what's being used. And, you know, when? Well, actually pretty much any point in a software lifecycle development, there's a use for an SBOM of software building materials because you need to know what you've got. You need to know if you've added a patch to it, how has it been built? Is there any certifications that are effective with it? You know, are there, you know, configs that have been used um, for the version you're using that might have a relevance in a safety argumentation? All of these elements here, um, could be, you should be able to generate a software bill of materials at any point in your life cycle is what it's coming down to. And be able to ask for a software bill of materials for any time you're taking and consuming in a, a piece of open source as part of a larger product. And quite frankly, you want to know what else is in the product in addition to open source too. So why is there a lot of people starting to wake up and start caring about this? Well, actually it's because there's money involved. Um, and the vulnerabilities and the impact of vulnerabilities are in the news, you know, pretty much every couple of weeks, you're seeing a new vulnerability that's impacting someone. And some of these are actually impacting people's lives. Um, you know, when there's a denial of service attack going on in a hospital and people can't get access to machines they need because they're being denied service, um, that starts to impact people's lives. So we, there's a large, a wide um, interest worldwide, pretty much in improving the cybersecurity um, in the supply chain. And the initiatives that are happening in the US are mostly revolving around the software bill of materials coming out of the NTIA effort and determining how we make that better. But, you know, what is emerging is, you know, these things are true and we are seeing like things like containers emerge and containers um, are abstracting and hiding even further all those detailed pieces that are being used in the system. And so having that transparency and having that uh, ability to understand exactly what you're looking at is a prerequisite for any type of safety analysis. And we need to figure out how to get it there. And we're also seeing some of the regulatory authorities um, decide weighing in on this now, especially in the safety critical spaces. Like the FDA has um, signaled that they will be looking for one. They have not given a date, but it has been signaled. So the medical industry is paying you know, very close attention to this. And then uh, recently the um, energy uh, FERC, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee, has weighed in and expect saying that they are expecting to see and have that expectation of that software transparency. And so a lot of these stakeholders are coming together and working to actually come up with um, this minimum viable that I was chatting about. And here's, um, like you say, from the NERC SIP 13, 
um, you know, it's all about supply chain risk management, and it has that expectation that you will have some sort of way of understanding what software you're running. So you can do the risk assessment. It's simple as that. So who should be using an SBOM? Well, pretty much anyone that's making um, software and um, deploying software on their systems. You should be asking for them if you, for anything you're buying, and you should also be um, being able to produce them on the fly so that if there's a vulnerability coming out, you'd be able to you should know what exactly is in your system and what you're running, and whether you not you need to remediate or not. And a lot of the aspects that are coming in could be coming in from the contractual, the legal, or the technical from the vulnerability side, but it also could be from the dependency side and it could be the analysis side, the systemic analysis side to make sure your system is safe in context and in deploy. And so all of these things are leading us to this type of presence. And at the end of the day, um, software build materials just make financial sense. Um, there's been a quote um, that's come out from, um, you know, it's sending, you know, saving hundreds of thousands of man hours rather than scrambling around fire drill mode. If you know that you can just look it up as a query on your system um, and understand which components you have and where they're being deployed, where these software components are and what systems they've been deployed on, um, you can much more effectively manage uh, remediations as well as, um, ensure that the system can stay up and operational and fulfill any safety obligations you have with it. So at the Linux Foundation, we're looking at a few projects um, in this space to help with these efforts. Um, there's common processes and norms, um, working with open chain, and that's now an ISO standard um, that is able to specify what the obligations and expectations are. Um, we're looking and working towards building up common data formats. Uh, Software Package Data Exchange, or SPDX, has been around for 10 years. It's able to satisfy the minimum viable that's been um, arrived at from the NTIA process. And then we also are starting to work on pulling together all the tooling to make effective workflows for generating and consuming software bill materials so you understand what you've got on your systems at any point in time. And those workflows and are happening within the Automated Compliance Tooling Project or ACT. And if you go actually into the specification um, for open chain, you'll actually see that, um, you know, right at the very start, like, you know, one section, it's a very, it's a short specification. It's easy to read. It's about 10 pages. Um, and it's calling for the material that you're, you're summarizing and passing through the supply chain is the software bill materials. And it has open source components that are listed. And so this is part of pulling together having sort of standard ways of exchanging the information and having standard formats that everyone can consume um, is going to be part of improving that transparency that we're all going to be looking for, especially in the safety cases. So next step is, well, if there's functional safety considerations, um, how do we focus on understanding the interfaces, quality and safety characteristics of the open source projects involved? We need to actually, you know, up the level of analysis information that's available and is digestible uh, for projects. And so that when there are in a safety argumentation, someone integrates them in with their value, the system can be looked at and studied and determined that yes, there is a safety you know, issue or and what are the mitigations we might apply to improve the risk, things like that. So that hasn't been a consideration to a large extent in a lot of open source projects up till now, and that's starting to shift. Um, here at the Linux Foundation, there's several of our projects that are actively looking at being able to be used in functional safety, um, from Zephyr and Cell4, which have smaller footprints, to, you know, Acorn and Zen, which are hypervisors. Automotive Grade Linux is looking at it, and then Elisa is looking at trying to pull these frameworks together to work with Linux. And so let me start with the bigger one, which is Elisa, and then I'll um, go down to one of the other ones. So Elisa um, started off because it stands for Enabling Linux and Safety Critical Applications, which is pretty much on spot for this. Um, over the last you know, 30 years, Linux has pretty much grown to be the most important open source project in the world. And 69% of the embedded systems marketplace is already running Linux by estimates that have come up um, in the last years and from other studies. And as a result of that, um, you know, we need to be able to handle Linux in because a lot of these applications you were just sort of seeing, um, they're using Linux in them right now. And the automotive cars um, and the you know, SpaceX rockets, so forth, 
These are all systems that have Linux in them and we need to make sure that it's staying, um, when it's being used, it's being safe. So we're trying to figure out how do we actually do, you know, how do we actually get the information and do the right level of analysis? And so at the end of, at the heart of it, you know, you need to assess whether a system is safe. It's not Linux itself is safe, it's how are you using Linux, is that safe? And you have to understand your system for it to be effective. Um, and that is at the key of the argument, you know, the, the thinking here is, okay, how do, you know, how do we, are we able to articulate how Linux is being used and can we move that forward? So, understanding how you use it is at the key. You have to understand your system. You have to understand the Linux interactions. Okay, what APIs are you using? You know, what dependencies may there be in your system that have also are working with Linux? How are the interactions? How has it been configured? All of these are key elements here. And you need to um, work with, when you're using, depending on certain properties in Linux, like a scheduler, um, you need to ensure that the quality is there as well as the um, behaviors are as expected. And when errors happen, can you recover? Back to, you know, the days of uh, Margaret, you know, Hamilton's analysis for rockets, same things are holding true today, but we need, we've got a very much more sophisticated code base. And so the safety standards, um, you know, were um, designed with a certain methodology in mind. Um, Linux has evolved over 29 years and it's continuously being developed. And so it does have a very high level of quality. Um, you know, there's continuous improvement processes in place. There's things that a lot of the standards are sort of hinting that they want. They're just being expressed slightly differently in Linux. And there's a lot of evidence from the testing that goes on that the process quality and the process improvement quality already exists. There's, a, you know, there's the develop maintainers get together. There's a self-reflection period every year to try to figure out what needs to be done better. And we have a lot of testing infrastructures and frameworks that are out there that are working with Linux. Um, being able to pull this evidence together and make it accessible for people doing the safety analysis is at the heart of what Elisa is going for. So the mission statement for the project is to define, maintain a common set of elements, uh, which on uh, processes and tools that can be incorporated into specific uh, Linux-based safety critical systems amenable to safety certification. So what we need to do is figuring out this gap closure that we we're talking about. Um, there's a lot of information that safety standards are looking for. Um, there's a working group inside LISA that's looking at how to close those gaps. And they're working with the kernel community um, on you know, understanding what's there. We wanna to try to get you know, elements upstream. We wanna get documentation published. We wanna get this information available in the upstream as well as have reference material available for people who are going after um, safety uh, argumentation to draw on. And then in the components like the scheduler, like the memory management units, things like that, well, there's various properties because people are depending on these systems to work. And how do we do the right analysis of the interfaces coming into them, as well as um, understanding these, um, you know, what will happen if a fault happens, can we recover, and making sure that these components are well analyzed and so that people can build it into the rest of their analysis. Part of Elisa is also working with, um, you know, okay, you can't just look at Linux as its own. As we sort of said, it has to be in a system. So we've been looking for open source um, applications that are available out there. There's a medical devices working group that's looking at the open APS, um, which is an artificial pancreas um, loop system between a glucose monitor and an insulin pump. Um, that's a hobbyist project, but everything is nicely open. It's running on a Raspberry Pi. So it gives us a basis to analyze down to what's Linux doing in the system. And then there's the automotive working group as well that is looking at various applications that will be in automotives that are using Linux for like tail, tail apps and so forth. And doing the analysis again to figure out what parts of Linux are being used um, and building from there. Um, Elisa is able to spin up any other working groups. Any, there's a lot of interest in industrial and robotics and hopefully we'll get one of some of those going in the next year. Key is that any applications we start looking at that will feed into the rest of the analysis need to be not under NDAs and we need to have them open so we can do the analysis and collaborate. Um, yeah, the heart of Lisa is a collaboration. Um, we're not gonna be engineering any specific system to be safe. Um, you know, 
we can't ensure that people who are using it actually read the documentation and understand the processes. However, we're going to try to create some so that those who are motivated can. And, you know, we're not creating a standalone Linux distro or anything like that. It's just how to use the upstream kernel and how to be effective at this. And, you know, we're not going to be able to leave you from any responsibilities under all these conditions. But we are going to be trying to provide a path forward and people to collaborate with. And so that's what Elise is there. And so if you've got an interesting case, um, we'd encourage you to come and look and work with us in the project. When we're done, um, we should hopefully have, you know, the assets help ready for um, helping people go through the safety certification. So we want to have, you know, here's your process. Here's how you do your analysis. Here's the features you need to look at. Um, here's where evidence is. Here's some tools to help you understand do your analysis in your system. And we want to show that it's feasible to do this in some reference systems that everyone can look at. Like the key is a lot of this work happens right now in companies today under NDA, so no one can see it. And so what we're trying to do is do things in the open so we can share it with others. Um, we want to be able to help educate um, those system integrators on the things that they need to look at. And with the view that these things are going to have to be maintained over industrial life cycles, which can be, you know, anywhere from, you know, two years, which is your standard end of life on your, you know, on a device or five years for your phone or, you know, 20 years for a piece of infrastructure in your city or even longer in some cases. Um, but there is um, a lot of information. We want to make sure that the information we're putting, providing is accepted by the safety community and certification authorities. And so that, you know, there's multiple people who are going to be doing these audits, who understand the evidence that's there and can help educate slash make sure that the right factors are considered to make sure these systems are safe when these third party audits are happening. And, um, you know, we'd also, for us to be effective here, the Linux community needs to be able to understand what we're doing and recognize it and make sure that, you know, some of the things we'd like to upstream into the documentation as we do the analysis and you know, be able to share. We have a way, mostly the kernel community is very much motivated to fixing bugs. And a lot of these things are just bugs. So we need to fix these bugs and we need to make sure that we've documented how, you know, the information that's out there. And eventually we will want to have hardware collateral um, as well from the various vendors. We need the hardware vendors to be bought in because we're running on their silicon and their boards for that matter. So if you want more information about ELISA, um, I encourage you to probably go to our next um, 2021 virtual workshop. Um, we've been doing workshops roughly every quarter. Uh, we were doing it in person. And then with uh, the latest pandemic, we've been having to switch to virtual. We've actually had more people attending and we've had a lot more engagement as well. So uh, I think we're working on a format that helps encourage discussion and engagement. So think, you know, feel free to check us out, just lurk or I'll start participating in the discussions. And if you want to get more engaged, uh, feel free to sign up for the mail lists. It's open to anyone and you can start looking at our sources and um, the GitHub um, repos are there. Now switching over from Linux and a big abstract system, let's go and look down at what's happening on those sensors and actuators. And um, Zephyr project has um, been designed pretty much to work where Linux is just too big. Uh, Linux doesn't get much smaller than two megs these days. And a lot of the embedded space is, you know, very, very, cost constrained, footprint constrained, um, very tight on memory. And so Zephyr has been designed to act in this area. And when we started the project off uh, about four and a half years ago, we wanted to make sure that it would be able to be a real-time operating system. And we built it right from the start with the view that we were going to be going after safety certifications and security certifications. So we built it with safety and security in mind. And the community is lined up around the fact that we are going to need to have some discipline in certain areas to be able to go after and work with the standards as they exist today. So it's cross architecture has a broad um, base of um, hardware platforms is over 200 um, boards that have been ported into it. It has vendor neutral governance. No one company own, you know, is in dominant control of it. And the checks and balances are in the governance document so that, um, you know, the technical steering committee determines, you know, which direction the projects are going. Um, it's permissively licensed, which makes it suitable in cer from certain companies' minds. And it is, you know, very modular, like the Linux kernel is, and highly flexible. And like the Linux kernel, it's also adopted the notion of a long-term support kernel. 
and this is where we are encouraging people to work for, for products and a subset of those, the next LTS will actually be ready to go through the safety um, audits. And so we're working towards that goal in the project now. As you can see, it's a rather full architecture. These are all modular components that can be enabled as needed. So this way you can sort of scale your footprint based on what your functionality you need is and then work from there. And it's a wide range of communication technologies because it's IoT, we need to obviously communicate off of these. Um, and so um, if you're interested in more details, um, it is, uh, they're available from the project. And as you can see, it's a pretty fully featured OS at this point in time that lets people be, lets it be a good um, RTOS basis for applications. And we've actually been seeing now products emerge in the marketplace. Um, None of these here listed per se are safety critical, but they're wearables and they're getting into some of the platforms. So you're sort of seeing this project shift and as the safety critical certifications emerge, we're expecting to see more of the safety critical applications coming in. Um, there's a couple of products here that are being used in, they were spun up very quickly. Um, there's things like the distancer from Phytech, which lets you know, um, you know, with, when you're coming within a zone of people, the six foot zone, and then the Centrius from their technologies is also, um, you know, designed for um, monitoring the distances and the characteristics, including, you know, there's also the safety pods um, from breaking in the factories and for giving feedback if you're getting too close or recording who you've been getting close to and things like that for tracking and traceability. So we're seeing Zephyr being deployed in situations that are gonna be helpful for um, us getting through this next few years. And they, can't, they were able to spin up these applications very quickly from the product base. So, but like I say, we'll be getting after more safety critical. We're in wearables type of deal right now, but I think it's gonna be emerging into getting into uh, more of these tight loops and um, more of the safety critical functionality. So we, just, we established our safety committee for the project in 2019, we were found mature enough we meet every two weeks and um, the participants are um, people who understand um, safety considerations and the implications in that committee and are working to help educate the rest of the community on that. The initial target for the project is going to be 61508 um, SILT level three. And um, we've already been established our coding guidelines and those are being applied through the project right now. And we're working on getting the continuous integration enforcement going in. And then there's multiple safety activities that are sort of going on to establish the traceability, uh, the requirements test coverage, the tooling and so forth. And the safety committee is taking the lead on this and then working with the TSC to make sure it goes through the entire ecosystem. And we are also engaging with the certification authorities in this project right now. Um, we're looking at how do we, um, you know, how do we basically go through the safety plans and the argumentation? So it's a much more traditional um, safety path, then we're sort of doing in Linux. At the heart of it, although um, quality is going to be the foundation and high quality code and making sure that we have our defects under control, um, it's not additional from because of the safety, but we have to have it there fundamentally for security as well as for safety. We need to have that quality level there. And what we've been trying to do though is with open source, we have a very rapid change where new functionality is added, new features are added and so forth. And so we've been working on a um, development um, repository and that has a release every four months. And so it has a fairly frequent cadence and it comes up with, here's what we need to be doing um, and here's new features. And then we you know, sort of make sure we have a release that we keep, keep the squashing the bugs down, things like that. And then every two years we come up with our long-term support and we agree to maintain that and put fi security fixes and backports in over time. And then the safety and security processes will be taking a subset of that LTS and that's, that subset is what we'll be taking through the first certifications. So that audible subset is, you know, um, it's gonna be established from that LTS and our LTS, next LTS will be next year in the summer and we'll be keeping the code bases in sync with it. And obviously the more rigorous processes we need and the traceability we need for those elements in there are going to be um, what we're focusing on. And the actual processes are being you know, developed um, by the safety and security committees and we coordinate with the technical steering committees. 
And for this, for Zephyr, we're basically trying to follow the uh, more of a traditional beam model with um, understanding, you know, the specification, the features, um, you know, making sure we've got the documentation, the traceability, um, you know, the committers are known and information is known about them. And then the goal is to improve the evidence um, that open source development can map. So what we're looking at is, okay, as we understand um, our requirements for a reference system and Zephyr as a component in there, you know, do we have, um, you know, the requirements documented and visible to everyone to provide feedback? You know, how is the architecture going to work? And then what's tests all these steps all the way down? And because Zephyr is a very modular framework, um, we're taking advantage of that to just focus on some initial um, elements. Um, there was certain parts of that our stack have been declared in focus initially. And so the APIs and then the um, basically subsets of some of the devices in the kernel scheduler, as well as interrupt handler, power management and so forth. These are all common elements that most systems need. And that'll be the focus of the first um, um, you know, our first one for 61.508. And then over time, we hope to extend out to more and more of Zephyr as resources and interests emerge from our members and from the community as a whole. You know, some of the things that we've been talking about have been like crypto and the Flash and the POSIX APIs. These are all elements that will probably be added as uh, resources and interest emerges in there. We've got this initial base um, stabilized. So, um, Right now, we just finished putting out our 2.4 release, and we have, as part of that, there was a project coding guidelines that were made visible. We're working on our tooling processes right now and starting to work up the documentation that we're going to be needing um, for the safety scope and working on the tool evaluation. So engaging the certification authorities. So we're working towards making sure we actually have all the evidence necessary for the argumentation, and we're working towards having that ready um, when we get to the LTS, then we can be able to go through an assessment. So if you're interested in learning more about Zephyr, um, there's information up on our GitHub repo or check out the website. And um, we also have a Slack channel and there's a lot of orientation information out there too. So feel free to have a look or subscribe to the mail list and work, um, all's fine. But um, certainly we would welcome anyone's participation and um, obviously patches are welcome. So in summary, um, I think functional safety standards can coexist with the open source projects, but we need to become efficient at scale. And part of that efficiency at scale is um, doing some abstraction and summarizing, okay, do we actually know all the components that are there? Can we put it at our fingertips immediately? Um, and so can we need to look at getting that, that part abstracted and getting that part automated? And as you can sort of see, um, in both Linux and in Zephyr and the other projects, we need to make have a very strict focus on quality and shrinking down the bugs. And you know we have to focus at that quality at the, each of those components has to be quality because when they're all put together, we have to have a quality system. So we need to focus at quality at the project level. And then we also need to quite frankly manage developer and certification authority expectations. You know we have to have well-defined scopes and we have to focus on our interfaces. And then we have to have understanding of, you know, the blocks inside those interfaces. Um, and if we can get all of that pulled together, I think we'll actually start to be in a really good position for doing the analysis and feeling confident that the software we're using in systems, and particularly for safety critical systems, is as safe as we know how to make it. And with that, I will say thank you, and I will be available in the channel for any questions you may have. <laughs>